today we're going to start talking about the score block. The score block can sometimes be a little confusing at first, but it's essential that you understand how it works before we can really dig deep into working with larger projects within LilyPond. We're going to be starting off with a few bullet points. First, what the score block is. Next, what the score block isn't. And finally, why you must include the score block when you engrave your music. Before we start talking about the score block, let's take a moment and go over some of what we've already learned so far. We know that we can input our music and assign instruments to variables, and then call those variables later in the file so we can see its output. This concept of basic organization is something you need to really be comfortable with because you're going to be using it pretty much with all of your scores. So although we haven't used the score block yet in this video series, it's actually been included every time we engraved our music. We just didn't explicitly include it in our files. This is something that LilyPond does for us, behind the scenes, which I'll be showing you in a moment. Let's talk about these three bullet points now. Number one, what is the score block? In its most basic form, the score block is the place in your input file where you put everything relating to your actual score. It's where everything is summed together. You only put things in the score block that pertain to the score itself. It's the section of your input file where you put things that are related to your musical score, what you see on the paper. I realize this may seem like a really simplified definition, but I just didn't want to rush this part of the lesson. I'll be spending the next few videos on the score block, and we'll be going over the best practices when creating your input files from scratch for various ensembles, like full orchestra, some chamber groups, a wind ensemble, and SATB choir. Each score block corresponds to one score in the output. A score block is considered to be a top-level expression, like the paper block. For our purposes in these tutorials, think of the score block as being whatever you want to appear on the page as far as how you want to represent your score. Most of the time, you'll want to keep your variables, which can also be thought of as definitions, separate from your score, but technically it's not required. However, it will save you a lot of grief and frustration later on when you need to edit your file, debug something, or with creating parts for performers. Here are a few key points regarding the score block. To put it another way, there must only be one outer music expression in your score block, and it must be surrounded by curly brackets. Now this particular expression can be any size, anything from a few notes to an entire opera. This expression can contain other expressions to any complexity. So to recap, there can only be one outermost music expression in a score block, and it needs to be within curly brackets. Let's look at the basic structure of your input files as we've covered so far. Version statement, your header, definitions, and now the score block. So what other stuff goes in your score block? A few examples would be layout preferences, MIDI options, and new staves for your instrument definitions. 
If you recall from an earlier video, the paper block contains settings that relate to the page formatting of an entire document, and that's not something that goes within the score block. However, the layout block contains settings for the specific layout of your score itself, and this can go in the score block. I'll be covering the layout block in greater detail in a future video, but in a nutshell, this block has settings like indentation, spacing overrides, stuff like that. I'll also be covering the MIDI block in an upcoming video as well. There is one other section of the structure that can be included, and that is tweaks. These are optional adjustments to your score. We haven't covered tweaks, but there will be a lot of videos dealing with all the possible tweaks that you can make to your score. So that's bullet point number one. Let's move on to number two. What the score block is not. The score block is not a place to store any old code that you don't really have a place for. Or maybe you didn't feel like scrolling all the way to the top of your input file, so you just dump some code in the score block. This is not a good practice at all. If your input file gets so long it's feeling a bit out of control, consider enabling the folding option in Frescobaldi, which collapses your code and makes life much easier. I strongly suggest that you keep the score block as neat as possible and as clean as possible without any extra code. It really shouldn't be a sort of catch-all for miscellaneous code or tweaks. In later videos, I'll show you how to polish your score and keep your adjustments separate from your score in a separate file altogether. So far, we've taken a look at what the score block is and what it isn't. Now on to the final bullet point. Number three. Every score needs a score block, but why do we need it? We haven't used it before in our examples. In all of my previous videos, we haven't yet added a score block to any of the examples. So you may be asking then, how can it be that every score needs a score block when we haven't seen it so far? Well, that's a very good question. Here's the answer. It is true that I have never explicitly put the score block in any of my files. However, technically, you don't have to manually input a score block in order to output a file with no errors. Even if you don't explicitly designate a score block, LilyPond will provide one for you behind the scenes. LilyPond automatically adds the commands which are needed when you give it simple input. Consider this example. We see here that we have a simple piece of music. There is relative mode to the C above middle C and a few pitches. But LilyPond sees something a little different. The program actually sees this code as being shorthand for this. I know we haven't covered some of these commands, but we'll be getting to those shortly. The important thing to note at this point is that we've always been using the score block, even without knowing it. For any music engraving project that is more than just a simple, quick example of a scratch file, it's highly recommended that you always include a score block. It will make your life much easier down the road. And when working on a large project, having a clear structure to your LilyPond input files becomes vital. So that's a very basic introduction to the score block and why it's important and why you need it. If you've made it this far in my tutorial series, then the rest will be smooth sailing from now on. Hang in there. You guys are doing great. Don't give up. If you need to rewatch any of the earlier videos in the playlist, that's okay too. LilyPond is a very powerful professional engraving program with amazing results. 
but sometimes it can be confusing or intimidating if you aren't familiar with the syntax. If you ever have any questions or requests for videos, please feel free to leave a comment below. I'd be happy to help. Also, remember that the mailing list is your best bet for getting support from the community. Before this video wraps up, I want to show you the score block in action. Let's take a look at an example together.